You may have heard about this guy, Nayib Bukele, the president of El Salvador. He has been in the spotlight since he won the presidential election in 2019. He is very into Bitcoin and made El Salvador the first country in the world to use Bitcoin as a legal tender. This means that Bitcoin is recognized as a medium of currency in El Salvador. But Nayib is also very known for another thing, his crackdown on gangs within the country. El Salvador has a long history of gang violence, which peaked in 2015 when the country had one of the highest homicide rates in the world at 103 per 100,000 people. This translates to a staggering 6,650 homicides that year, making it the most violent country in the Western Hemisphere. However, there has been a significant decrease since then, with the homicide rate dropping to 52 per 100,000 people, which is 3,340 homicides by 2018. Upon assuming office in June 2019, President Nayib Bukele pledged to make combating gang violence the cornerstone of his administration. Unveiling the ambitious territorial control plan, he sought a multi-pronged approach to reclaim control of crime-ridden areas and bolster national security. The plan's initial phase focused on saturating high gang activity municipalities with a surge of military and police presence. This show of force aimed to disrupt gang operations, deter future violence, and reassure beleaguered communities. Additionally, a controversial aspect involved tightening prison control by confining inmates to their cells and severing cell phone access, effectively isolating them from their criminal networks and hindering communication. Furthermore, the plan prioritized modernizing law enforcement capabilities. The National Civil Police received upgraded equipment like patrol vehicles and ballistic vests, while the Salvadoran Army benefited from improved surveillance technology and communication systems. These advancements aim to equip security forces with the tools necessary to effectively respond to gang activity and gather crucial intelligence. The territorial control plan sparked heated debate, with supporters praising its initial success in reducing homicide rates and opponents raising concerns about its heavy-handed tactics and potential for human rights abuses. While its long-term impact remains to be seen, Bukel's initiative undoubtedly shifted the national conversation on gang violence and ignited a discussion about the most effective strategies to combat this deeply entrenched societal issue. El Salvador was jolted by a horrific surge in violence between April 24th and 27th, 2020, with 77 murders recorded in just four days. The Bukele administration attributed this brutal spike to gang activity orchestrated within the country's prisons. Their response? A harsh crackdown marked by unprecedented measures. First came the nationwide prison lockdown. Confined to their cells 24 sevenths, inmates experienced an abrupt loss of even basic movement. Adding another layer of tension, the government reportedly mixed rival gang members together, potentially fueling further animosity. Images of this overcrowded confinement, circulated by the government itself, sparked immediate controversy. Human rights groups, including Human Rights Watch, sharply condemned these actions. They raised concerns about potential violations of fundamental rights, especially considering the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and the heightened risk of disease transmission in cramped conditions. Additionally, critics questioned the effectiveness of such harsh measures, highlighting potential long-term consequences like radicalization within prison walls. El Salvador experienced a dramatic drop in homicides in 2021, reaching its lowest rate since the Civil War ended in 1992, with only 18 per 100,000 people. While the decline started before President Nayib Bukele took office in 2019, he proudly claimed his policies, like the Territorial Control Plan, were responsible for this turnaround, making it one of his most celebrated achievements. His sky-high approval rating, hovering around 85%, reflects this public approval. However, a dark cloud of controversy overshadows the plummeting homicide numbers. In December 2021, 
the U.S. government accused Bukele's administration of secretly negotiating with notorious gangs, offering financial and prison benefits in exchange for reduced violence. The U.S. Department of the Treasury even sanctioned two Salvadoran officials linked to the alleged talks. Naib denied the accusations, calling them lies and criticizing previous administrations for similar tactics. El Salvador was plunged into chaos in late March 2022 as a shocking surge in violence claimed 87 lives in just three days. This unprecedented bloodshed, with 62 victims falling on a single Saturday, marked the deadliest day in decades and left the nation reeling. In contrast, the entire previous month had seen only 79 murders. The brutality struck indiscriminately, leaving no one safe. The government pointed fingers at the notorious Mara Salvatrucha, better known as MS-13, but the motive remained shrouded in speculation. One theory, voiced by William Ulysses Soriano Herrera, a member of President Bukele's party, linked the violence to the government's crackdown on gang-controlled bus routes, a lucrative extortion source. Professor Jose Miguel Cruz of Florida International University suggested a different angle. Perhaps the gangs were sending a message to the government, seeking more favorable terms. Regardless of the reason, the bloodshed ignited public outcry and fueled debate about the most effective ways to combat gang violence. The incident left a lasting mark on El Salvador, highlighting the deep-rooted challenges the nation faces and the urgent need for solutions. In March 2022, El Salvador embarked on a controversial path with the declaration of a state of exception, a drastic measure aimed at curbing the rampant gang violence plaguing the nation. This move, met with both fervent support and opposition, suspended key rights like freedom of association and legal counsel, allowing for increased detention and warrantless surveillance. While proponents saw it as a necessary evil, a decisive action to dismantle the stranglehold of MS-13, critics argued it overstepped legal boundaries, infringing upon fundamental human rights and potentially sowing the seeds of future unrest. The crackdown manifested in several forms. Sentences for gang members were significantly increased, with some facing decades behind bars. The age of criminal responsibility was lowered from 16 to 12, raising concerns about the potential impact on vulnerable youth. Sharing gang messages, even for media outlets deemed to be amplifying their voices, became punishable by lengthy imprisonment. This hardline approach was coupled with mass arrests, straining the already overcrowded prison system. Authorities reportedly set arrest quotas and pressured the judicial system, leading to concerns about due process and fairness, with many detained unaware of specific charges or reasons for their arrest. Conditions within the prisons mirrored the severity of the crackdown. Food rations were reduced, and reports of harsh treatment, including overcrowding and denial of basic necessities, emerged. To address the overcrowding, a massive new prison capable of holding 40,000 inmates was constructed, dubbed the Terrorism Confinement Center, a name that further fueled the debate. The government even went as far as destroying tombstones of gang members to prevent glorifying them, drawing comparisons to denazification efforts and raising questions about historical parallels and the potential for unintended consequences. Another controversial tactic was the siege of Soyapango, a densely populated city deemed a gang stronghold. 10,000 soldiers surrounded the city, conducting mass arrests and erasing gang graffiti. The state of exception has been extended multiple times, sparking heated debate. While the homicide rate has indeed decreased, questions remain about the long-term consequences. Doubts linger regarding the sustainability of this approach, the potential for exacerbating gang recruitment and the lasting damage to El Salvador's social fabric. The country now finds itself at a crossroads, grappling with the complex issue of balancing security with individual liberties in the face of deeply entrenched gang violence. Only time will tell if this controversial crackdown truly leads to a safer El Salvador, or if it leaves behind a deeper scar on the nation's already troubled history.
El Salvador's brutal crackdown on gangs in 2022, while met with domestic support, ignited a firestorm of controversy internationally. The streets felt safer, with gang presence visibly reduced, but the methods employed raised alarm bells about potential human rights violations and the sustainability of such an approach. Within El Salvador, the crackdown enjoyed overwhelming public approval. 91% of citizens, weary of violence, felt safer with reduced gang activity. Businesses operated freely, and residents moved without fear of extortion. Buchel's initiatives aimed to tackle the root causes of gang recruitment, offering education and community spaces to vulnerable youth. Internationally, the crackdown drew mixed reactions. Leaders in Guatemala, Honduras, Costa Rica, and Peru expressed interest, with some implementing similar measures. U.S. conservatives saw it favorably, while human rights groups condemned the arbitrary arrests and disregard for due process. Mexican and Colombian leaders offered mixed reactions, with some expressing curiosity and others raising concerns. Concerns were not unfounded. Human rights groups criticized the mass arrests based on appearance or residence, fearing innocent civilians were caught. The possibility of Naib using the crackdown to consolidate power and target critics also caused unease. The U.S. called for respect for due process and civil liberties, highlighting the delicate balance between security and human rights. Beyond immediate gains, questions lingered. Could the crackdown be sustained without exacerbating gang recruitment? What would the long-term impact be on El Salvador's security and human rights? Transitioning out of the state of exception and addressing the root causes of gang violence remained significant challenges. With the March 2024 elections concluded and Naib's resounding victory cemented, the shadow of the gang crackdown looms larger than ever. While domestic support remains fervent, the international community grapples with the truth. The man who promised a safer El Salvador now holds the reins for another term, his methods still shrouded in controversy. The streets feel safer, businesses may operate more freely, but the scars of the crackdown run deep. Human rights concerns linger, the potential for abuse of power simmers, and questions about long-term sustainability echo. Is this a genuine turning point or a gilded cage built on shaky foundations? Naib's re-election adds another layer to the complex narrative. Will his continued leadership translate the perceived safety into lasting peace and prosperity? Or will the erosion of rights and the potential for further violence overshadow any short-term gains? Only time and the choices made under Naib's continued rule can answer these questions. The future of El Salvador hangs in the balance a delicate dance between security and human rights, progress and potential peril. The world watches, holding its breath as this controversial chapter unfolds its next act. I hope you enjoyed this video where we talked about El Salvador's transitioning. If you would like us to make more videos about current political situations in the world, then be sure to like and subscribe.